The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. It's been a pretty good spot over the years, but it's a grind. When we did the wetland, it was amazing. They just showed up. Aquatic systems and rivers, unless you're really looking, you don't see all those species and the diversity that lives below the surface. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Oyster season is underway in Lavaca Bay. This is my home port right here, Port Lavaca, Texas. I've been a pretty good spot over the years, but it's a grind. Uh, this is what I do for a long time. That was 30 years yesterday. That's why I've been pitching over here, this bait. We got so much salt in our blood that that's what I love to do. If you love what you do, I mean, you're gonna stay for a long time like me. 30 years. They call them the oysters. What they're doing right now is uh, they making sure that they got three inches of oysters. The state law said that it had to be three inches. Plus, you see, it's a cluster, so what they come up, they don't come pretty like when you put them on your table. Historically, Texas has been one of the top states in oyster production, dating as far back to the late 1800s. Texas reefs held what seemed like an endless supply, but times have changed. Over the years, the daily sack limits have been cut back. It used to be 150 sacks a day. Now Mauricio can keep a fifth of that. Now it's a, they went down from 150 sacks to 90 sacks, and then from 90 sacks they went to uh, 50 sacks. This year, the limit, state limit is 30 sacks. So every year we get less and less and less. And the bad part is the fuel, it don't go down, it goes up and up. But like right now, we're probably gonna make 20 sacks all day long, maybe. Recent science has indicated that Really, most oyster reefs are operating right on the, the border of sustainability. Everybody realizes that something needs to be done. This part of Galveston Bay is getting some much needed TLC in the form of a new reef bottom. The key to restoring the habitat is putting fresh culch out there. Culch could be any materials that oysters can grow on. This reef's getting 7,000 tons of crushed limestone. Looks good. It's really amazing how you're able to operate this giant piece of machinery on a barge. Yeah. This is really important because the oyster reefs are in pretty bad shape. They've been suffering from a number of stressors, including drought and hurricanes. And on top of that, there's a lot of heavy fishing pressure being put on. Pretty sad state of affairs for the oyster reefs currently. So these materials provide a nice clean, what we call a substrate for oyster larvae to attach to and grow into spat, which are baby oysters. The site will be closed to commercial harvest for two years, allowing the baby oysters time to grow to adulthood. 
By the fall, there should be millions of baby oysters growing on this rock out here. Galveston Bay is not alone. Many Texas bays are temporarily closed to oystering as the reefs recover. You the captain today? To protect the bays yeah, as see. they rest, game wardens are on the water. This area is open to oystering, but nearby San Antonio Bay is closed and off limits. Today what we did, we tried a different technique we haven't tried yet. We actually stuck a boat in the water that was an undercover vessel, and he actually drove out into San Antonio Bay, hid up in the brush for a little bit. TX4051. And he drove down that line and basically wrote down the TX numbers of every boat that was located in the San Antonio Bay system side. They were too close to land and they were in closed water, and they don't have any tags. They gave order. Y'all were in closed waters this morning. Me? Yeah. No. Yes. It's not all the oyster industry that's actually doing this. There's a there's a few bad apples. He observed you in closed water. No? Yes. No. No. You're gonna have to dump the oysters too. If we let them do what they want, then they would take too much of the resource and there wouldn't be any of the resource left. Okay, one ticket for oyster in closed waters. Okay. Contact Judge Hunt. You have your license on you? If they over harvest an area, it does them no good the next year and the year after that and the year after that. Short term gain, long term loss is what we're looking at. It's going to be nothing. How the bay is going to come back? If you kill the chicken, you ain't going to have egg. We need those ocean restricted areas for them to spawn and get ocean everywhere. It's bottom line. You kill the chicken, you ain't going to get no egg. To protect the reefs, at times, there's more bays closed to oystering than those that are open, which adds to the grind. You know, you leave it one area, a small area open, everybody's going to put pressure on the area because it's the only thing is open. And that's what happened right now. When you overfish the resources, they're just going to disappear. A lot of small ones. This one should be ready within four weeks. They're gonna reach three inches. They have to go back to the water. This bay for right now should be being closed for two months. They keep it wide open and there's nothing out there anymore, you know? By the time they close it, it's gonna be too late. It's hopefully not too late. A historic restoration plan is in place. All bays in Texas will now get some much needed help. As a new law requires oyster dealers to either pay a per sack restoration fee or recycle their old shell. Supplier Curtis Miller opts to use his own shell. I felt that would be the quickest way to, you know, see some results. This was a way to see the quickest turnaround right here at home. This reef recovery plan now guarantees new culch will be placed in depleted Texas bays. This shell is on its way back to Lavaca Bay. We're going to put it out there in this area. It's not really a viable working area now, but we're hoping since it's a hard bottom, the shell will create a new reef that we can work, you know, in a couple years. But this is going to happen all up and down the coast in every major oyster producing bay. This is just the very beginning of something that will be an ongoing effort and should make a, a really big difference in the ecology of the bays. If everybody up and down the coast starts doing this, which I believe you're gonna start seeing, that'll make more reefs in Galveston Bay, more reefs in Matagorda area, more reefs in Rockport area, more reefs in, in our area, and the, the boats will be able to stay home. We need to change the habit. We had to change the way we think for those bays to give them a chance to come back. We had to do all those things, you know. For resources to be there, yes, you got to take responsibility. That's all. And for Mauricio, a restored Lavaca Bay can't come soon enough. His haul today barely covered the costs for his crew. Well, we managed to make a day. At least we're here, you know. Nobody got hurt. We were shooting for 20. As you can see, we didn't have 20. We had 17. But the boat didn't break. We're happy. We're ready to go home now. But you can bet he'll be back here tomorrow. I enjoy it. Every single day that I'm out there, I'm enjoy it. I'm happy. 
And that's the spirit of the fisherman. It doesn't matter how broke you are. If you love it, what you're doing, you're going to keep it doing it. And that's me. I've always wanted to live in the country, to be honest, ever since I was a kid. Actually, one of my, my dad's friends, who was a rancher, is the one that found the property. He's the one that convinced my parents that it'd be a good purchase. I bought the initial property back in 1983, the 300 acres, and then over the years added to it. Would like to add more, don't know if that'll ever happen or not, but you never know. The biggest thing about the Shady W that makes it stand out from other properties in this area is that part of it is Parton's patience with the process. You know, we really started with a kind of a blank canvas. I'd call him and give him some recommendations and the weather conditions wouldn't work out, and he'd say, hey, it didn't work. What can we do? So we'd make another recommendation and go with it again. And so he was just really patient with that process. And it paid off. We've had some really good restorations out here. And it's, it's been overall a very big success. A lot of this area has been converted to non-native grasses historically. And Parton's taken back over 70% of his property back to natives. Once they got established, we started seeing particularly the birds when we did the uh, wetland, uh, it was amazing. Uh, I thought it would take a while for the ducks to kind of figure it out. It didn't take them any time. They just showed up. We do burns. Prescribed burns one of the best tools around. And so just kind of trying to refresh that growth, it kind of just resets it. You get a lot more annual forage, things like that. We're burning a little later than we usually have, so this is probably really help a lot of summer grass growth. You know, when we started this that morning, it wasn't burning that well. I was happy we got as much scorch on these yeah. lower deals as we did. I mean, it was really just creeping. Yeah. I mean, that wasn't even foot tall flames. Yeah, we did a good number up front. Oh yeah, looking at it from the edge, I was curious how well that fire was going to carry through when we burned it. Man, it, it, it did. It did very, very, well. very well. There's little stuff just that sprouted everywhere. In like fact, that first night after the burn, there was an owl over there by the wetland yeah. where it was burned. I was like, man, you didn't waste any time, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm about as pleased as I can be with how this turned out. Well, and particularly as green as it was, I don't think any of us expected it to be as <laughs> yeah, good a burn all as the it winter was. Rest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're pretty proud of our, our fisheries program. Uh, John Jones and his crew have done a great job. Ooh. Now for the fun part. Now for the fun part. We currently actually hold, I think, four state record uh, fly fishing on private water state records. I'm trying to beat the, the state record largemouth bass, but it's eluded me yet, but I'm, I'm still working at it. You can just tell he just loves being on the land and being a part of the land and seeing it benefit from his management. It's just the, the learning experience as you go along to me is what's so fascinating. You know, I learn something every year and I hope I keep learning. <laughs> All the stuff he's done out here is, is pretty unique. I think it sets him apart from most other landowners in the area, the willingness he has to let people out here and see it learn from it, and just share what makes him happy with other people to make them happy. I think that's pretty special. So I see rivers as really the lifeblood of our ecosystems. You know, they provide water, habitat, and food, and there's just a huge diversity across the state of Texas of all of our aquatic species. Aquatic systems and rivers, uh, they're, they're not well understood and they can kind of be easily ignored. Unless you're really looking, you don't see all those species and the diversity that lives below the surface. Devil's River Minnow? Rivers don't just support aquatic species, but they're important for people and for terrestrial species, birds, plants. Part of our mission is to protect these resources for future generations. Texas's population is growing, as we all know, and as there's more urban development, more people moving here, 
a lot of our natural lands and big ranches are being subdivided. We see a lot of changes to the landscape and that all has a direct impact to the rivers. And that can really impact the species. And so that's part of what we try to do is restore lands that have been uh, degraded and help protect those lands that are still intact. Texas Shiner. Sarah has a good personality for working with people. That's been pretty evident in the number of partnerships she's been able to build. All the work we do in the River Studies program is based on partnerships and collaborating. So we work with nonprofits and landowners and universities to conduct this research and then to also implement practices to help conserve and protect our rivers. Sarah is just a remarkable person. She forges relationships with people that that go beyond what they're trying to accomplish and and she's able to do so much conservation good across the state. Sarah's been an exceptional employee. The things that she's accomplished in a relatively short time I feel hopeful that uh, in our environment will be protected and managed in the best best way possible. So it's always you know been in the back of my mind when I do this work that we want to preserve these places and these rivers and these species for future generations. Uh, but now that I'm a mom myself, you know I really see some of these places under threat, and I want to make sure that they're there for my son to visit and for us to visit and spend time at as he he grows up. At the new public library in Austin, there are many ways to learn about ecology, sustainability, and wildlife like birds and butterflies. Come on in. One way is to go to the top. Before opening day, oh, yeah. library facilities manager John Gillum discusses some of the building's more unique features. Homage to the grackle. Everybody goes, why is it red? Because it's art. The art may be red. A third of our energy is going to be produced by solar power. But the building is all green. It will be the greenest building that the green city of Austin has yet produced. Right up to the roof. This is the, uh, the rooftop garden, which we also call the butterfly garden. It is a green roof. It, it needs a, a roof that's actually landscaped. The library is crowned with an outdoor habitat landscaped with native plants. We wanted to do something to help out our little pollinator. We'll do anything we can to uh, track them. If we can come up with different plants, we think uh, we'll draw more butterflies, we'll do it. An oasis of native plants can help bees and butterflies like migrating monarchs make their way through increasingly urban landscapes. And it also makes for a nice spot to sit and read. This is really uh, the best part of the library as far as a, a natural setting to sit in. It should be a lot of fun. Putting a park on a building also saves space and lowers energy costs when temperatures soar. We don't have a lot of yard here, right? This is a very urban environment where we built. And so we had to get really clever about how we got vegetation and nature into the immediate area as opposed to the concrete around us. This is gonna be an area that really absorbs heat rather than reflects it out. So even in the kind of summers that we get here in Austin, this is still gonna be a pretty pleasant place to be. So birds, bugs, and bookworms in an age when news about nature is not always so cheery, look for some good news way up on the top shelf of Austin's Central Library. We're here on the uh, southeast corner of uh, Texas, and uh, we're here at uh, Sea Rim State Park. 
about 10 miles west of Sabine Pass. We're a relatively small park. I know the water's going to eat you. <laughs> uh, we do have uh, five miles of beach. The majority of this park is marshland. And uh, a lot of people that come out here to enjoy the park enjoy either the, the beach or they get the chance to enjoy, experience the marsh environment. The, the neat thing about the Gambusian Nature Trail is you're just right above the water. Crab, 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 crab. It's a wonderful way to experience the marshland environment without getting your feet wet. Well, I'll get her, I'll get her. I'll get her right here. Right here. Baby alligator. It's right here. You see him? There's probably a mama nearby. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I think it's really cool. I, like, I've never experienced actually seeing an alligator in its natural habitat, and it's really cool to actually see one in person. It's easy, it's easily accessible, and it's a nice long trail where you're really isolated from the rest of the world and you don't realize that there's any civilization around. And it's just a, a hidden gem, I suppose you would call it. We have over 10 miles of paddling trails. So pretty out here. There's uh, different canals, lakes, small areas that uh, people can get out and uh, explore on their own. You uh, get a chance to observe, be one with nature. <laughs> I love this. Ah, a fish jumped in my boat. Ah, hang on. We're out here on uh, Seabrim's East Beach. Oh, someone! It's a wonderful spot to, uh, to go crabbing. I do have uh, some uh, chicken necks that are already tied up to the string here. It's like fishing. Yeah. What's on it? Yeah. I didn't have any idea it would involve chicken. I thought you would sort of cast a net, pull them in, and, and it would be done. <laughs> Not the crabbies. Uh-oh, you got, I think you got a bite. You do. Pull it in real slow. Woo. Been in Southeast Texas 15 years. This is my first Look time. Look at there, man. That's a keepy. Oh, it's great. The kids are having a blast, and we are too. I think I'm having more fun than the kids. I got one. Thank. Hey, yo. Get it, get it, get it. It's a big one. Yeah. It is fun. Woo, there's one. I didn't know about it, and I don't think a lot of people do know about it. That's a little scoundrel. Oh. Oh, got it. Especially if you're into crabs. We have caught so many crabs today. You think you see it? You got a crab! Oh, I got two. Two, two for one. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> one day I caught two. <laughs> we come out here at least about every other weekend. We just kind of grew up out here fishing. <laughs> oh, you lost your bait, baby. It's fun. Family loves it. My son loves it. Almost every day after work, he says, come on, we're going fishing. I'm like, OK, it's fine with me. Oh, you really never know what you're going to catch out here. Bull red coming in with it. It was pretty shallow. It was probably the second sandbar. I have to tag this one. This one's over 28. All right. Mira. Seaworm State Park is a uh, park that uh, not very many people are aware of. You're not going to hear all buzzing traffic or anything like that. You're away from it all. And uh, you can come out here and enjoy, enjoy life.
This series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places.